Hello world, it is PG.biz podcast. I am your co-host Peggy Ann Saltz, and I am so happy to welcome Brian Baglow back. Brian, you are back in the truest sense of the word. People are saying, where were you all these weeks? I know, but why don't you tell us? Because it was it was epic. Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm finally back after the madness, chaos and um, victory that was Scottish Games Week. So uh, for anyone out there who's not been bored to tears with me banging on about it over the last several months, we organised a week-long series of events around the video games industry here in Scotland. And boy, let me tell you, Peggy, it was it was quite something. So we had double the number of speakers, double the delegates, um, a whole lot more sponsors, but we've made some pretty big breakthroughs. So the, the, the support that we've had from the government here in Scotland has been um, phenomenal. And it really culminated with their um, agreement that they're going to help us and work with us to produce a national video game strategy. And that's going to be the first part of the UK to have such a thing. So it's going to be really quite exciting. And looking at this from the ecosystem perspective that we have, I think we can do something really quite extraordinary. So it's been fantastic. It's been a whole lot of fun. Uh, it promises to make 2024 that little bit more interesting. But oh my, I am so glad to be back with you guys and doing something simpler and, um, you know, a, a little um, more fulfilling with uh, the PG.biz podcast. So it's lovely to be here. It's great to have you back, Brian. I had no idea what you had accomplished. So that is fantastic. And I'm already connecting a lot of the dots with some of the people. We had some great speakers out there from all across North America and Europe and connecting them up with the whole team. So I'll make sure we get the benefit of um, our keynotes and some of the really sort of amazing thinkers that we had across the whole of the week. You're talking about amazing people. We're back and we have an encore with my games because as you will remember, we had Anton a while back looking at growth tips and strategy. And now we are back again, but I'm so excited because not only is she amazing, but it's actually one of her first podcasts. She's really popular. She was in charge of marketing and brand as a CMO at My Games and later as chief strategy officer. And now she takes the helm as CEO. That is a huge leap. It's a huge accomplishment. And that's why this podcast is here to welcome you, Elena. Welcome you and uh, congratulations as well. Thank you very much for having me. It would be a great pleasure for me to talk with you today. And back at you, Elena. Really looking forward to finding out more about your journey and, and more about my games. So obviously a huge move. But you've been there since the beginning. You've been in your company since the beginning. You've also been in the market since it, the beginning. And it's changing fast. Uh, a lot of things are going on. One thing you notice a lot more is product is key. Product and marketing moving closer together. And that's what you've also started to do or moved to another level at My Games. Tell me about the efforts and how they're evolving to make this work. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Thank you for for that. My first role was connected with the marketing. And uh, um, I hardly can say that our marketing team was once seriously separated from our development that you mentioned. Our problem that time was in a different area. We as a large company had experienced a lot of uh, stages of centralization of marketing function and its decentralization. I believe it's pretty the same issue for many different companies and there are pros and cons on, in both approaches. And when I joined the company nine years ago, the marketing function was completely decentralized, given to the studios without any central expertise and unified knowledge. And there were studies with a bunch of marketers in completely different levels of skills. And there are some studies without any marketing at all. And it's usually this decentralization leads to the uh, asymmetric development of, of expertise. And what I managed to do almost nine years ago was to create the hybrid structure combining the central marketing structure and studio marketing teams. Some were responsible for the accumulation of the most skilled knowledge and exchange of the expertise, while others were responsible for communication with the product and guarantee the connection with the production team. And I believe that the balance between these two blocks and sharing their responsibilities and motivation between them 
was a kind of my know-how. And I'm really proud of the results we have got at the end of the day. Uh, this team, it's almost 200 high professional marketers, specialists, was proven instrument in maximizing the potential of our more than 80 games, contributing to the remarkable almost 10 times growth of our business over the last eight years. In a sense, these efforts has not, not only transformed our team, but have also played as a pivot role in positioning my games as a leader in the gaming industry. And definitely this journey continues with ongoing improvement of our strategies to the navigate to navigate in the ever evolving uh, gaming landscape successfully. I think it's fair to say that not only that, the, 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 with the challenge of restructuring and centralising, you also have um, faced the challenge of, of moving the company um, internationally um, from Russia to, to Amsterdam. So you guys must really love a challenge. Uh, I believe it's very important to uh, synthesise that even before the main part of our business were concentrated in uh, US and Europe in terms of the revenue, in terms of the focus for our production. And our key territories in terms of the revenue stream was, and it's still there, is US, UK, France, and Germany. And moreover, our headquarter in Amsterdam, it's, uh, it was you know, established many years ago, not just now. And uh, the second biggest office in Cyprus was formed about 10 years ago, if I can remember. So uh, definitely now um, there is slight changes, but nevertheless, even in 2020, we started to think about work from anywhere set up during the pandemic time. And at the moment, more than 90% of our company's employers has been working outside of the office in countries all around the world. And as I mentioned, we have offices in Amsterdam and in Cyprus, and it's one of the oldest ones for us. But this year, you're right, we opened additional hubs uh, for our employees in Abu Dhabi, for example, in Serbia, in Georgia, in some other countries. I've heard so much about Georgia recently. It just seems to be where the action is. It's really hopping. I mean, you're there as well. Um, what are your thoughts about where mobile games companies need to be? Definitely a lot of uh, IT specialists and gaming specialists moving to different countries, Georgia, one of them, and it's a huge community formed there. And as my games, for example, we, the same story, use this country to, to form our community there, to communicate not only with our employees, but the total gaming community at the territory to arrange the masterclass, the webinars for the uh, community there to help them to grow, to find the growth point for their products, for them personally as a talents and so on. But nevertheless, I believe that the main point is at the moment for gaming companies, remote work by default is really important point. And for us in my games, we um, transfer it to the remote to work during the pandemic and establish this principle slightly after that. And it works till today and really think that it's efficient enough. Moreover, for example, we realized the efficiency of this work format. Then at the end of 2020, we successfully launched our hit game, Rush Royale. And remarkably that Rush Royale was developed fully on the remote, remote regime for our employees. And this game is one of our biggest hit at the moment. That's amazing, Alina. And, and obviously, despite all of the, the disruption, upheaval and um, the, the focus, you are still achieving some very, very big numbers. Um, I believe you've chalked up a 14-fold increase in marketing investments at MyGames with a four-fold increase in the company's business. Um, and you have some seriously impressive uh, numbers for your top rated titles. Rush Royale, War Robots, of course, Hustle Castle, Left to Survive and, and others. Um, I mean, Rush Royale itself has had over uh, 63 million installs and generated 230 million in revenue. And War Robots, one of my favourites, just seems to go on forever with 250 million registered players and counting. But you've got a much larger portfolio. Um, with titles in various stages of development. So you guys are a powerhouse uh, at a time when some studios are cutting back. So what, you know, what's your, what's your goal? What's your drive? 
how come you guys are powering ahead when others are playing it very safe? I believe, you know, that the source of our courage usually lies in our team's expertise, adaptivity and the passion for gaming. And we are agile in responding of gaming market shifts, productivity in uh, identifying emerging trends and driven by the shared belief in the transformative impact of games that we definitely, definitely have. Brian loves the game. He just said one of his favorites. I've read about it, so I'm a believer. But, you know, you have to convince others, partners, investors, people outside when they are all feeling like this is not the time necessarily to power ahead. It is a time to be safe. But no, you have you have this courage. It has to come from uh, within, but also convincing others. How are you doing that? How are you getting partners, others on board. Maybe you're just really convincing as a person, Elaine, you just have a great personality <laughs> and you just tell them, they're like, yeah, we're on board. But no, what, what is the secret here? I think that number one, it's definitely the diversification strategy that we have. It persuades our partners greatly because this diversification helps us to have a stable business, taking into account that the gaming business is heat driven business and usually it's up and down and so on. But while you have huge portfolio and set of studios, it's much easier for you to keep the stable rate of your, of your growth. And it's our path. And I think that one of the primary efforts that fueled our growth definitely is our focus on diversification. We expanded our portfolio to cover multiple gaming platforms. We have PC, console, and mobile studios in our, you know, in our family. And this approach allows us to tap into different audience segments, adapting to the various preferences of gamers across the globe. So we definitely have this diversification in terms of the platform, but at the same time, we have diversification in terms of the genres because all of our studios have their own the kind of preferences in terms of the genres they would like to develop and that they are experienced at. It again, it helps us to approach different audience with help of different genres. And one more way, way of diversification for us, for example, is diversification in terms of the business models. Because number one, definitely we have our own studios who develop the product for us that we are published. But at the same time, we have the licensing business as well. So we license the products from third party developers to publish them all around the world. It can help us to, you know, to guarantee different and new revenue stream into our, into our business. And number third, in terms of the, in terms of the diversification business models is our investment arm. We have pretty strong investment arm called SimGVC who's in charge of the looking for the talented teams and products on the, on the globe. And we acquire some studios uh, based off of their results. And it means that we have three different source of product in our portfolio, our own development, licensing, and investment. And this diversification helps us greatly to guarantee the, you know, the stable growth of our business. I can see exactly why that would remove some of the, the risk and give you that resilience to ride out marketplace changes. But a big part of that diversification is also diversity and inclusion. Um, and you are one of the regretfully small number of female CEOs in, in a market. So it's a path less travelled. So can you tell us a little bit more about your journey and, and sort of the challenges you've faced? Because uh, it's it, it's so rare to get a chance to, to speak to a woman who has come through from the very beginning and, and is now leading such a, you know, an impressive studio. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for, for this question and synthesizing that because I have been working in the gaming industry almost all my life, you know, 23 years in my career connected with games. And even if I've been fortunate to have the supportive network throughout my career, I used to have almost all men among my colleagues. And this is, uh, has long been the norm of my life. And the higher you go, the fewer women you meet on the way. 
And in reality, I'm very proud that in our company, in my games, the share of women in the leadership is about 45%. I believe it's very impressive. And even, even fourth, we do not have any strict rules regarding the gender balance in teams. We do a lot of to ensure that women in our company, in our team can realize their full, full potential. And I believe that it works great. And myself is the one more example how it works. But if you talk about the challenging, what exactly challenges I have at the moment and during the previous year, the most challenging part for me was to find the work-life balance of it on this path, because definitely it's a case for a woman even much more you know, comprehensive compared with the men. And it's still one of the most difficult parts for me and because I really love what I do. I really give myself a lot to the process. And so this balance is not always possible, but I am the CEO of the growing game company. I'm the mother of two and I'm the wife of the amazing husband. I'm daughter and sister and I'm a person with my hobbies and interests and so on. So sounds challenging and it is definitely challenging, but I still do my best to find this balance every day. One thing that comes up again and again is it has to be diverse, which is very important because you get all views, all types, but you also have to have that talent and bring that up. So, you know, for women in successful positions, it's about helping younger women up the ladder. Or for you, since you're multicultural, it's about, you know, incorporating and bringing these other territories, you know, up the ladder in the sense that bringing them into your organization, that's not easy. You just don't say here, I'm open, or yes, I'm going to mentor you. Uh, there's more to it than that. I'd be very interested in understanding how you do this. How do you cultivate these relationships that are so well aligned with your culture? Yes, definitely. It's not just words. It's the total set of procedures that we have in the company, the procedures of the transparency and open dialogue between different managers, because we have rather a horizontal structure and everyone can ask any question to anyone. And definitely I'm open for any of our employees to talk and discuss the ideas. And talking about the women, we have a lot of practices in the company, uh, some, you know, mentors programs and so on, helping anyone to realize the full potential inside the company or outside. So we are trying to, uh, you know, to educate them, to talk with them and to help them to grow and to find the growth point for everyone. And this is a kind of inside the, inside the DNA of the company. I just want to add that your report card of 45% women in leadership positions that's well done. If it was, if it wasn't virtual, it'd be a, a high five to you, Elena. So thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm really proud of this number. Well done. You're right. That's it. It, it is very, very impressive. Um, I want to kind of um, stay on on your journey for a moment, if if we can, Elena, because you, you know you've been, as you said, 23 years in this industry, and, and you must have seen a lot. You know, you've had so many positions, uh, head of games at Disney for eight years, um, so. What have you seen in terms of the highs and the lows and how have you stayed on track after all of this time? And, and do you have any observations or, or kind of inspiration that you can share for people who are just starting out on their journey in games? Yeah, you're right. I have been working in games for ages already. And over the years, the industry has completely changed several times. So, of course, the current situation in the gaming industry is not the easiest one, but I'm sure that we will be able to overcome and find new forms of interaction with our players in reaching the gaming experience at the end. But what we all uh, think that in any difficult times, I'm sorry, it's worth focusing your efforts on the main things. For us, definitely the main things, it's our main products that already generate the notice noticeable revenue for us. And it's worth looking for additional source of revenue in them, enhancing operations, alternative platforms, new territories, and so on. And definitely all of us believe that today it's time to be 
more prudent in terms of the new risky investments. But at the same time, it's so important to focus your promising growth points. And if we do everything right, we definitely will be able to stay uh, afloat in difficult times and grow with the new round of the industry circle. So which do you find more exciting? You talked about alternative app stores. That's really the buzz right now. It's like, yes, it's going to happen in 2024. So I have more opportunities to get my game in front of more people. That's amazing. Other people, no, I'm really into AI. And we just had a show recently talking about how AI will even create adaptive play. It will like give you the game you want. I mean, these are out there. So these are trends. This is not right now. Just like to understand what gets you really excited, where you see the opportunity for my games, but maybe also for our audience listening in, some blue ocean they're not thinking about. I don't think it's a kind of blue ocean for the industry in general, but I think it can be the blue ocean for us. It's my games. Uh, what we're talking about at the moment, we're talking about the new territories. Uh, more uh, working more closely with some territories because at the beginning and in reality now the main part of our revenue comes from the US and Europe and definitely all of us knows that half of our gaming market are concentrated in Asia countries and we see at the moment that our potential there is great great enough and definitely we tried to grow our business there sometimes that it wasn't so successful. But now we we believe that we have one more point of growth there. Because for example, um, maybe you heard about that, that uh, one of our key product, Virobots, succeeded to receive the ISBN at the end of this year. Finally, after five years of waiting, finally we have the opportunity to publish our key products in China. And we are going to launch it in China at the beginning of next year. And it's so impressive for me. And I really hope that it will be successful there, that the audience in China will adore the game as it's adored by, by, others, but by other players. I really believe in the new territories for us, China, for example, for, for wire robots. And we have kind of similar story with our second hit, Rush Royale, because Rush Royale um, have a huge potential in South Korea, for example. And it's very interesting for, for us to try to do something special there, a kind of local marketing and local operations. Uh, at the moment, this territory is number four in terms of the revenue stream, but we believe it should be much more impressive in our numbers. So we will do a lot of local efforts there for, for Rush Royale. So for us, 2024 will be more concentrated with the local campaigns in Asian market for some of our key products. And it's really impressed me a lot. You know, Brian, I'm thinking it's going to be super impressive to understand how to localize to these markets. So that's, that's already, I've just stuck a pin in that one to have you back to, uh, to talk about that as well. Yeah. Going to China and making that a success, that will be exciting. Yes, definitely. I will be more than happy to share our success and our ideas with you later on as soon as we launch the product. Of course, we are trying to do our best to be successful there and do a lot of local stuff, not only in terms of the product itself, but in terms of the um, communication with our community there, in terms of our marketing activities. So definitely, I could share much more information with you as soon as the product will be launched there. One additional question, if I, if I might, Elena, is, is looking looking beyond that, you know, that that's what's next for my games. What is coming out? You know, we've got so many emerging technologies, so many new sort of changes coming in the games market. What are you looking at maybe for 25, 26 and beyond? You know, where where is my games seeing the future taking us? Talking about the next thing. You know, I think that the most amazing thing that we can, uh, be, what it can be next for any gaming company is definitely the launch of our new games. And uh, for next year and for 2025, we have a lot of plans for launching of new products and our pipeline is so well done at the moment. So we are planning to release uh, new games in 2024. 
and the pipeline is filled this, with a diverse array of mobile and PC console products. Just for example, this year we've announced incredibly well-received title such as Our Robot Frontiers. It's PC console um, product. It's the same Our Robots franchise. And it's so impressive for us as well. Try to grow the franchise in general with help of new product on PC console and involve new audience into the franchise. And number two, in the second product, I would like to underline definitely it's Hoked. It's again PC console release that had been developed for us three plus years. It's very impressive plan. And this product is going to be released at the very beginning of next year. And as well, definitely, we have many other captivating mobile games in our portfolio. So what we think about our future, definitely, we think about new products because we are the product gaming company and we should think about the product and find the, um, you know, the great game for us, for our employees and for our players. But before we let you go, we have two questions that we ask all of our guests, um, really, again, to bring it back to the games. And so the first one is, what are you playing right now? What's what's on your mobile? What's on your, your, your laptop? And the second question is, what's your favorite game of all time? Wow. Uh, in reality, at the moment, I'm playing some of our new announced games because I would like to, you know, to to have my own opinion and to understand. And I'm in, in full discussions with our development team in terms of the experience I have. So some of them are on mobile devices, another one um, on console. So it's it's very impressive for me to be a part of the development team, even if at the moment I'm not there 100% of my time, but definitely it's my passion. That's why I'm here. That's why I like to work in close collaboration with our development team. That's why our new product is what one more point of my interest, definitely. That's a great answer. So the answer is top secret. That's okay. That's okay. This is why we have to invite you back. <laughs> yes, I would be more than happy to join you later. Your favorite game of all time. Do you, do you have a preference? I think that I spent a lot of years playing the Heroes of Mind Magic. It was so many years ago, but it was the start. And I believe it's very important what is the first game for you that you know, help you to understand what is your what is going to be your professional in the future. That's why it's so important game for me. That's why I I would like to synthesize this game in this in this rating. That's a great answer, and nobody can argue with Might and Magic. It's 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 a classic for a reason. You're right. You're right. It was so interesting speaking with you, Elena. Finding out diversification where that fits in in your strategy hearing about where you're going next, learning maybe about how to crack the Chinese market. Just great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will be more than happy to share these ideas with you as well. It's been a real pleasure. Um, we're going to let you go. It's you have an entire company to run across multiple territories and nations around the world. So I'm sure you're very busy, but we would love to have you back on at some point soon just to find out more about My Game's ongoing journey and indeed your own. So thanks again, and we'll look forward to speaking to you in the near future. Yeah, thank you very much. Good luck to you guys. This show is all about how to do your job better, how to make an amazing game, how to market it. And you have a say. So if you have a story or know someone we need to shine a light on, then we would love to hear from you. We want to hear from you. We want to reflect the reality of the mobile games market and all its wonderful complexity and strangeness. So if you have any suggestions for us, if you have any feedback for us, you can always get in touch. You can email us at podcast at pocketgamer.biz. You can find us on Twitter at pgbiz. And you can reach out to us through the pocketgamer.biz website. If you're interested in listening to all of our podcasts, you can find them at pocketgamer.biz forward slash podcast. And we would love to hear your thoughts on future shows. And we've got you covered on all the major platforms. So subscribe to the audio podcast, as Brian said. Look for us on YouTube. If you want to read it, hey, you can do that too, because we have a companion post for you as well on the pocketgamer.biz website. Tune in again for the next edition of the pocketgamer.biz podcast and we look forward to speaking to you in the near future. Until then, I'm Brian Baglow. 
I'm Peggy Ann Saltz, and that's a wrap until next week.